Each week on Culinary Confidential, Christina Cates, a seasoned foodie who has worked at some of New York City's top restaurants, will share her passion for the culinary world. Whether you're a professional chef, a restaurant enthusiast, or a lover of good food, Christina dives into the heart of hospitality, exploring the trends, triumphs, and challenges facing the food service profession. And you won't want to miss her chats with some of the most interesting and influential industry voices. And now, please take your seat at the table as Culinary Confidential with Christina Cates starts now, exclusively on AM 970, The Answer. Welcome to Culinary Confidential with Christina Cates. This show is produced in association with my dear friend, Lucas A. Ferrara. Just to give a little bit of background of myself, for any first-time listeners, I am someone who knew early on in life that I wanted to be in the restaurant business and pursued that aggressively. I went to culinary school downtown in New York City just two weeks after graduating high school and wound up managing a few impressive places during my tenure. I am a guest experience focused individual and feel most at home managing high-end busy restaurants. In my free time, I love exploring new places to dine, whether it's in New York City or somewhere else in the world. Food is universal and something we can all relate to and find common ground talking about. I love sharing this hour with you talking about the food industry, a topic I'm so passionate about. This one hour we have together goes by so quickly, so I try and create a theme for each episode to help stay on track and pack as much information in with my incredible guests as possible. Tonight's episode is all about Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving is just a few days away, so I thought it would be fun to have an accomplished chef on the show to talk about some tips and tricks for the upcoming holiday. Joining us tonight is Chef Drew Keen of the super popular Gibson's Italia in Chicago. He has been polishing up his Thanksgiving recipes to share with us tonight. Thanksgiving isn't all about the food, though, or football. It's also about giving thanks, something that people forget to recognize, myself included. I have a very unique guest coming on the show later in the hour, Brian Proctor. He was a hotel executive with the Four Seasons, Hotels and Resorts, Starwood Hotels, and Bridge Street Global Hospitality, and is now the founder of Leeds Hospitality Group. But he also has a remarkable podcast called Tuesday's Thanks. Brian is an expert on gratitude and helps the next generation of leaders to embrace gratitude as part of their leadership skills. I will dive more into what Brian is doing with his incredible podcast and how he is making his mark in the hospitality industry later in the hour. So stay tuned for that. But let's move into the first part of the show. And let me please welcome Chef Drew Keen, Executive Chef of Gibson's Italia in Chicago. Chef, welcome to Culinary Confidential. Hey, what's up? Super stoked to be here. Thank you for having me. Oh, my pleasure. Let me give just a little bit of landscape of Chef Drew's expertise. He is a talented, self-taught chef that secured an executive chef position at just 23 years old. That is a huge undertaking and such an accomplishment, Chef. I'm just so impressed by that. When Chef thank Drew, you, thank you. <laughs> well, you're welcome. Oh, sorry. No, go. It's fine. When Chef Drew isn't running one of the busiest kitchens in Chicago, he dabbles in reality TV. Chef Drew was on season two of Chow House on the Food Network. Chow House is a cooking competition show that took place in Puglia, Italy, the epicenter of Italian culture and cuisine. Here, 12 talented chefs live and cook together to compete for the title of Last Chef Standing and to win a life-changing prize, an immersive culinary education with renowned master chefs around Italy. Chef Drew also offers online cooking classes at keenoncooking.com. The concept behind this online resource is to learn to cook restaurant-quality dishes at home with an industry pro. So what do you say? After hearing all of this, I think Chef Drew is more than qualified to steer our Thanksgiving dinner this year. Chef, you ready? I'm so ready. All right. Let's start with what kind of food did you grow up eating on Thanksgiving? Like, What were holiday foods that were... You know, foods your mom used to make or your grandmother used to make growing up. I mean, the all-time favorite was my grandmother made the stuffing that, I mean, uh, so far, she's the only one in the family that can truly execute it better than anyone to this day. Okay, uh, what's in your stuffing? 
Uh, and well, the one I, the one I replicate from her, it's, you know, it has uh, honey crisp apples. It has mm-hmm. like a, a like a maple sausage in it, and it's just it's so good. I think she just uses like box stuff and seasoning too, but I don't know what it is. And it's so good. Oh, that's amazing. My mom actually makes a really good stuffing as well, and she also puts sausage in the stuffing, which is something I think. You know, as stuffing uh, evolves over the years, it's one of those ingredients people don't really put in anymore. But I've only ever, I grew up on the East Coast. I've only ever seen it on the East Coast. I haven't seen it anywhere else. Anywhere else. Okay, well, then that's what it is because obviously I'm from the East Coast too. <laughs> we like sausage yeah. in our stuffing. Before we, so get, before we get into the main event, let's start with appetizers or starters for this fall holiday. Things that are good to put out as guests are arriving to nosh on, like some light bites that are easy to make ahead of time. I'm so sick of seeing everybody put out the basic puff pastry with a slice of brie cheese in it and the cranberry sauce with the sprig of rosemary on top for the hors d'oeuvres. Like, I need something more exciting. What do you recommend? Uh, there's a couple here that I like to do on the holidays, especially Thanksgiving. It's actually a, a little take on the, the brie. Is I rough it in puff pastry, almost like a, like a brie wellington. Like Ooh. a baked brie wellington is so good. And I actually like to pair, I like to uh, take cherries and cook down cherries with rosemary and a little bit of shallot. And that's so good with that uh, brie wellington. So you're making almost like a cranberry sauce. Right, but you know, not, with not, not that awesome. Yeah, not that cool tin shaped cranberry sauce. No, God, uh, no, with I the the love. lines in it, no way. <laughs> oh yeah, it was the best. My sister likes that. I think it's disgusting. It's like it's one of those things that's like so bad, but like good at the same time. It's always on the Thanksgiving table, and she's the only one that eats it. And then we have this like whole can of this jelly like cranberry disgustingness left every holiday. I'm like, do we really need this? It's so easy to make fresh cranberry sauce. Maybe you can tell us it's about so that easy. in a little while. Well, yeah. let's just talk about it now. How are you making your cranberry sauce? So I like to take fresh cranberries and then I kind of, you, you want to throw a little bit of water in there so they cook down a little bit and then uh, tons of sugar. Tons. I like to yeah. add ton, so much. <laughs> uh, I like to put cinnamon sticks in there, orange zest, orange zeus, Aren't zest, excuse me, aren't zest. And then it's really fun if you put some like Moroccan style spices in there, it's really good. Like a raza hanout is really good in there, or like a gram masala is excellent in cranberry sauce. Wow, those are things I don't even have in my pantry. I don't, I don't even think I've seen those ingredients in like a regular supermarket. Where can people get those exotic spices? Just online? Uh, online, there's uh, a lot of really great. Uh, Spice houses here in Chicago that I, I frequent that have it. But uh, garam masala is pretty... Is garam masala is, yeah. Most, mm-hmm. But yeah, raz al is a mixture of like, I think it's 27 di- different spices to make. So that's a, it's a couple of different things in that one. So your cranberry sauce isn't really traditional and just like a, a sweet and tart sauce. It's giving a little bit of kick to it also. I like a little spice, yeah. I, I tend not to, uh, I mean... I love the traditional way of preparing almost anything, but I like to do a little spice, my little flair on it, and you know, take it to the next level. That's what you're known for. All a right. Little bit. <laughs> <laughs> In my family, we always do a first course for every holiday, whether it's Thanksgiving or Christmas or Easter or anything like that, before the main event, which is usually the turkey. Our first course is always an Italian-American dish, like stuffed shells, and it has meatballs, sausage, a salad course. It's pretty heavy before a heavy dinner. So for those looking for something lighter to start with, what do you recommend? I will start by saying I absolutely love stuffed shells and will eat them on any day outside of Thanksgiving. <laughs> One of my favorites of all time. Um, and I, I like to stick with the pasta course, actually. Um, kind of when I go home I, uh, to my parents' house for the holidays, I like to make a pasta. Last year, I did something nice, uh, just a little honey nut. This would be butternut squash agni Ooh. with brown butter sage sauce. That's, I think that is, it can be heavy, but it's also simple, and it's easy to execute, and it's all those fall flavors. Yeah, I mean, the squashes, things like that, they're so available 
this time of year. So people should lean into ingredients like that, pumpkins and you know purees, and incorporate that into the first course. That will never happen at my holiday table because my family, believe it or not, they're very picky eaters. So it's amazing I have this culinary background that I do uh, with that start in life. But yeah, I, I I'm coming over to your house for Thanksgiving. Jeez. Oh, another yeah, another one of my favorites. I like to do like a caramelized onion uh, and ricotta filling ravioli with like an apple like brodo. That's like one of my favorites as well. Oh my gosh! You know what I made last Thanksgiving, which just inspired me now to make it this year. I made a caramelized onion galette, like a French onion galette. Oh. Right, because sometimes soup oh. is like just too heavy to have, like with the with the cheese and the bread, like a French onion soup before everything else. But that galette is like also something you can put out as an appetizer for when people are are gathering upon arrival. But you have to oh, make yeah. a good crust favorites. for that. Okay. Yeah, I mean, honestly, for me, I'm not much of a baker. I will use store bought crust. Sorry, I will definitely 100 percent do that. Um, I was actually uh, with Nancy Silverton one time, and she did a like a braised cipollini onion tart mm. and it was like each little tart like it was a bite like each bite was, was a small cipollini and it was excellent oh that sounds amazing but those cipollini onions are so annoying to have to peel because they're tiny or no you're talking about cipollini not the pearled onions no yeah the cipollini not pearl the, oh okay pearl onions are very classic but yeah it's, it's uh i like the cipollini a little better okay good all right let's move into some turkey let's talk turkey because that's the main event why everyone gathers around the table. Most people are buying frozen turkeys for their holiday dinners like, you know, at ShopRite or Stop and Shop or whatever you know standard grocery store you have in your town. How soon should people start defrosting the turkey before the holiday? And how do they do that safely to prevent foodborne illness? So the best way to do it is uh, a couple days before maybe three days, or if you're going to brine it, you can probably go up to five days because you don't you don't want to put your turkey in the brine frozen because uh, it'll dilute your brine. So I would say yes, yeah, between three and five days, do it in the fridge and have it do like a natural thaw. Don't let it sit on your counter. Don't run it under water in your sink. Uh, if it's a natural thaw, put it in a container to collect the water that might might be thawing out the ice. And that's the safest way to do it. But what about, like, it, does it depend on the size of the turkey? Like, if I have a 20-pound a turkey, I, I can't take that out the day before, right? I have to do that a little bit more in advance? No, I would stick with the three to five days with that one. Okay. I mean, when I grew up, my mother defrosted everything on the stove or the kitchen counter. Like, I'm lucky oh, I'm alive. That or, you know... Put it out on the on the back deck in the natural natural chill in November on the East Coast. That's what, that was a classic. But then the food gets into those like temperature danger zones when the bacteria starts to grow, and that's why it's not recommended to leave it on the counter. Like you have to do it the safe way and let it defrost, you know, in a certain time in a temperature controlled environment like the refrigerator. Exactly. That's why I always recommend you can do it in the. Uh, refrigerator or, you know, you can do it in a cooler if you control the, you know, control the temperature with that. Yeah, the, the, the old school days of leaving on the counter or the, the back patio next to the 30 rack is, uh, those days are gone. Yeah. <laughs> What's the standard cooking time for turkey? I know it depends also, again, on the size of the turkey for how long you should cook it. But, like, what's a good barometer um, for listeners to know, like, you know, if I'm having 20 people over and I have this size turkey, like when do I start putting that in the oven so they can kind of manage their day? Yeah, so I live by the rule that 15 minutes per pound is exactly where I like it. So wherever poundage turkey is, turkey is times that by 15, and that's how long it takes. 15 minutes per pound. Okay, that's great information to know. I, I just have so many memories growing up because our house was always – The holiday house for every holiday. People would come. My mom would be roasting that turkey. It's in the oven at like 7 a.m. for guests that were coming over at 2. Like the whole house smelled like turkey when we woke up. So 15 minutes per pound. That's great to know. But turkey gets... Uh, The the early Thanksgiving dinner, I was always the 7 p.m. Thanksgiving dinner. So that thing was going around noon. Oh, you did a later, a later Thanksgiving dinner. Why is that? Always a... I don't know. I'm actually not really sure why we like the the midday. I never I never quite understood that one. I think my my dad worked shift work growing up, so maybe that's why. Oh, that could be. Yeah. So, so get some sleep in, and then uh, 
bang out all the prep. But yeah, I've, I've, uh, I don't think I've ever been to anyone's house that has a, a mid afternoon dance. Oh, it's always been we're a late, always like late, two o'clock. <laughs> oh man, I could do a turkey sandwich at two o'clock. I don't know if I could do a whole turkey at two o'clock. If you're just tuning in, I have Chef Drew Keen on the line from Gibson's Italia out in Chicago. He's been giving us tips and tricks for a proper Thanksgiving dinner. Okay, Chef Drew, I have another question. I tried to make cornbread once because I felt like that was very on trend for Thanksgiving, and it came out like a disaster. It was really just like corn cake, and it was not edible. Do you have any good cornbread Mm. recipes that you make? I do. I have a pretty simple cornbread uh, recipe. I like to put blueberries in my cornbread, too, as a little fresh fruit, kind of a little little more added sugar. Ooh, now you're going Um, crazy. little bit. And I also, like, anytime I'm baking, I like to use brown butter instead of just your regular unsalted butter. I like to get the nuttiness out of it. Oh, I've never tried to do that before. Like, I've heard of brown butter chocolate chip cookies, but I never so moved good. it into other recipes. I guess that would work really well in a cornbread recipe. It's also excellent if you're making your roux for your gravy. I always start this with brown butter as well. Okay, so I was just going to actually ask you about gravy. Like, I'm a very good cook, but things I don't make very well are sauces and gravies. They're just never thick enough. And then if I, you know, make the roux and you have to put the flour in and everything, it winds up tasting floury and it just isn't good. So steer us, like, how how can we make a, a tasty gravy or sauce for that turkey? Yeah, so one thing first, I would you know, I would use all the drippings from the turkey pan, and I would you know take the giblets out and the neck, and I'd boil that with some water and some aromatics, almost make like a light turkey stock. Hmm. And then you really you really want to cook that roux down. That's really the the thing is uh, taking the flour and the roux almost to the point where it's almost like a caramely blonde. This really, and then slowly add in your turkey stock and. Uh, you know, if you go too thin on that, you go too crazy, you can always add more room. Okay. Now, turkey gets but a yeah, bad really reputation want... of being dry and flavorless. What are some tips for cooking a juicy and vibrant bird this holiday? So I, I like to do two things. After a full, you know, at least a 24-hour brine is, a, is key to make sure it doesn't dry out. And what's a but brine a couple different... for people that don't brine know? Brine is like a, like a, it's almost like a, a salty seasoned water that you let your turkey so it takes in, it takes in all that flavor so you don't have to over season it and it makes sure it seasons all the way to the bone but what are you putting in your brine is it just herbs i like to do yes herbs salt sugar peppercorns bay leaf almost all the rosemary you could find i like a heavy rosemary on my turkey and then uh a lot of acid so lemons oranges um you know and then onions celery carrot all that goes in there and then we'll sit that overnight in your fridge, uh, 24 hours to 48 hours, the absolute most you can go on that. Mm. You don't put, and like, a little vinegar in there? Like sometimes... I, I use the acid from the citrus instead of using vinegar. Okay. Okay, that makes sense. We talked a little like, bit earlier... Works really well with that. We talked a little bit earlier about stuffing. Now, Thanksgiving turkey obviously needs stuffing, but there's always the debate on whether you need to stuff the bird or cook it on the side. What are your thoughts on this? I cook mine on the side. I, if you cook it inside the bird, it tends not to, to be soggy. I like mine, like, you know, crunchy top, soft bottom. Mm, yes, absolutely. All right, and Jeff, use a good brioche. Like a brioche bread? Yeah, oh yeah. But are you letting it become stale on the counter first? Because don't you have to make stuffing with stale bread? Yeah, cut it the day beforehand and let it sit out. Or you could do a light bake on it if you don't let it. I mean, just a, a lower temperature around 225, 275 for a couple minutes, it'll, it'll get stale. Okay. Chef Drew, do not go anywhere. We need to move to a commercial break real quick. But when we get back, I want to ask you some more Thanksgiving dishes. And I want to talk about some other things you have going on on your cooking online school that you do. So stay tuned. You're listening to Culinary Confidential with Christina Cates on AM 970, The Answer.
Hey, it's Joe Piscopo. You heard me talk about our partnership with Food for the Poor. And I can't think of a more appropriate time to remember the less fortunate than with the holidays coming up. Latin America and the Caribbean have experienced a perfect storm of economic decline, skyrocketing food prices, limited access to water, and the lingering impact of COVID, which threatens the future for children in these areas. Through a network of trusted ministry partners and local churches, Food for the Poor feeding centers are prepared to supply non-perishable food items and vitamin and protein-enriched meals to the children and families hardest hit by rising food prices and shortages. With your gift, you provide food security to parents whose children will no longer be in danger of starving. How many children can you save? To donate, call toll-free 855 919-4673. 855-919-H O P E. Hope. Click on the red Give Life banner at am970theanswer.com. Over the last 30 years, Newman Ferrara, a New York City law firm, has evolved into a national practice focused on real estate, commercial, litigation, civil rights, class actions, and other complex litigation, representing many of the city's largest property owners, managing agents, and thousands of tenants. Newman Ferrara handles some of the nation's most significant class actions and civil rights matters. Newman Ferrara at 1250 Broadway in New York City, Go online to NewmanFerrara.com. That's NewmanFerrara.com. Listen to the firm's name partner, Lucas Ferrara, every Saturday at 10 a.m. on Dottie Herman's longest-running real estate radio program, Eye on Real Estate on AM 970. A real estate lawyer for 35 years, Lucas is a professor at New York Law School and is also a published author with books on real estate and New York's landlord tenant law. Tune in Saturdays at 10 a.m. to hear Lucas's unique perspective and advice on Eye on Real Estate. A large retail store just canceled a huge order, leaving my pillow with a ton of extra my pillows. That's their loss and your gain. For the first time, you'll get a standard classic my pillow for wholesale prices only fourteen eighty eight. Even better for a limited time, they're going to offer their entire classic collection at wholesale prices. Queen size my pillows for just eighteen eighty eight. Upgrade to king size for only a dollar more. Body pillows for twenty nine eighty. And multi-use my pillows for only nine eighty-eight. Go to mypillow.com. Use the promo code Joe P or call eight hundred six five one zero seven nine eight. Take advantage of wholesale pricing and receive free shipping on orders over seventy-five dollars. There are limited quantities at this price, so the limit is going to be ten. And once they're gone, they are gone. Go to mypillow.com or call eight hundred six five one zero seven nine eight. Use the promo code Joe P to get the standard my pillow for only fourteen eighty-eight. The Christmas Mortgage Miracle is back for the seventh year. The Christmas Mortgage Miracle makes it possible to win next year's mortgage or rent. Just think, someone is going to win the grand prize of up to $18,000 to pay for 2025 mortgage or rent. Increase your opportunity to win when you interrupt a once per day and complete optional bonus tasks. Enter the Christmas Mortgage Miracle Sweepstakes. Visit am970theanswer.com. That's am970theanswer.com. Want to listen to AM970 The Answer on the go? There's an app for that. Download our free smartphone app so you can listen to all your favorite shows, keep up with us on social media, enter contests, win prizes, and even interact with our hosts all in one place. Just search AM970 The Answer in the iPhone App Store or the Google Play Store for the Android. Again, search AM970 The Answer and download our smartphone app today. That way, you can take us wherever you go. Welcome back to Culinary Confidential with Christina Cates on AM 970, The Answer. Okay, welcome back. This is the Thanksgiving episode. I have on the show with me today, Chef Drew Keen of Gibson's Italia out in Chicago. He is just a fantastic executive chef that's self-taught, and he's been giving us tips and tricks on how to host a nice day. So, Chef, welcome back to the show. 
Hey, what's up? Glad to be back. Okay. So I want to know, if you're the host of the holiday, what can you do to make the holiday go smoother so you're not stuck in the kitchen the whole day and you have time to actually spend with your guests? I would definitely do as much prep beforehand as possible and almost just use the oven to reheat or finish cooking what you've already accomplished so you have the time to mingle and talk and, you know, have some drinks with your friends and really embrace what the holiday is about. So it's really like the day or two before leading up to the holiday. You should be doing the bulk of all your cooking, like prepping. Absolutely. Yeah, you should be sweating on Thanksgiving. Yes. On Thanksgiving, you should be just having a glass of wine, having turkey, and, you know, shaking hands and kissing babies. Oh, yeah. What about fried turkeys? You know, we talked in, earlier in the segment just about how to cook turkey and things like that. But, like, some people fry turkeys and I think that's weird. Like, who who's doing that? Why is there a benefit of doing it? What's the downside of doing that? Well, the benefits of cooking a fried turkey, I'm not a fried turkey fan. I like the roast. But the benefits of it, it cooks significantly faster, and it, it retains its moisture more. So the, the chance of being your turkey being dry are very slim. The downside is you can absolutely burn your house down. You can give yourself third-degree burns. Mm. So I, I feel like the risk is higher than the reward of frying a turkey. Right. If they just listen to this show instead, you've taught people how to make a nice turkey so they wouldn't really need to risk their lives. But you should recommend to do that outdoors for sure. Yeah. Oh, 100 percent. Do not do it in your garage. Do not do it inside your house. I think the fire department puts out a video like every year of people's like turkey fails and then, you know, how to properly do it. Yeah. Oh, bad idea. Okay, so let's talk veggie side dishes because veggies sometimes get a bad reputation of being like boring, but I feel like Thanksgiving you can really dress them up in a lot of ways. What are you making this Thanksgiving for vegetables? So I actually go pretty hard on the veggie side. My partner is a vegetarian, so I always oh. show plenty of things for her to eat. Oh yeah. Uh my personal favorite is this is a little more very chefy, is I confit carrots and carrot juice. Oh my gosh. Uh Tell, what, yeah, now so okay, good. what does confit mean? Tell everyone what confit means. It means like cooking its own fat. Uh carrots obviously don't have any fat, so you can use oil or you can use carrot juice and then you take the carrot juice and you you know, for, uh, you cook that down with some butter, and then you season the carrots with honey, pine nuts, and like, and I like I like to do carrot top chimichurri. but salsa verde would work. Like a French salsa verde would be excellent, or just as many herbs as possible with that. All right, what else? That sounds delicious. I'm I'm not even vegetarian, oh, right. and I'm going to steal that recipe from you. Oh, it's so good. And then you know, in the Midwest here, uh, it's squash season, delicata squash. I like to do pretty simple. Uh, just roast it with a little bit of sherry vinegar, uh, a little smoked paprika, and then I like uh, crunchy bits, so I'm probably going to put some hazelnut, uh, hazelnuts on there. And then, again, with the herbs, I'll probably put some shallot in there as well, so some raw shallot, mm-hmm. and then I'll put parsley all over that. What about a nice fall salad? A nice fall salad, actually, we actually the one, that, uh, one I just put on Giffen's Italian menu here is excellent. It's a charred broccolini salad. With honey crisp apples, pistachio, roasted delicata squash, and a lambrusco vinaigrette, which is I think I I can use every single day. Okay, I would definitely get that. Sometimes I steer away from fall salads because I'm really weird with cheese. Like I have discovered that I actually don't like a lot of funky cheeses and fall salads always have like a goat cheese or like a gorgonzola crumble things like that so i'm always like oh that gets me out like i could order it without it but then the salad just doesn't taste the same so you just you put that salad on the menu it doesn't have any cheese on it no i don't i mean i love salad with cheese i don't think every salad needs cheese um i'm also not a big gorgonzola fan and that i agree that's very popular in this time of year but I feel like not everything needs to have that crazy funk to it, you know? Oh, I love you. I love you even more now. Okay. <laughs> now it's dessert time. What are we What are we cooking up for dessert? I mean, we're doing classic Thanksgiving type things, sweet potato pie, pumpkin pie, apple pie. I mean, I'm, I'm an absolute sucker for pumpkin pie. I love the pumpkin roll. Anything with cream cheese frosting, I could probably muffle down, you know? I think it's so good. Um, but I, I'll tell you what I, I make, and it's not one of my favorite desserts. I'll make a tiramisu. <gasps> That's uh, my favorite dessert. I think, 
Yeah, that's it's actually one of my least favorite dessert, oh. but I'll make it because it's my partner's favorite dessert, and it's a real crowd pleaser. Um, so, I mean, I'll make it. It's not my favorite. And then I love a bread pudding as well. All right. You and I just fell out of love here because we were aligned on the cheese thing. We broke up over the tiramisu, and bread pudding just totally gets me out. Okay. What about um some good fall cookies? Those are always good oh, to put out I, for, like, a platter for, like, kids and, you know, groups. Uh, kids, kids named Drew. Uh, we, we do pumpkin <laughs> cookies in my, in my family, and I don't know. I couldn't tell you one ingredient, but I love them. All right. Well, what's an easy way to elevate the meal and make it fancier, but not necessarily more complicated? So the best way to and, like, enhance any or, like, really uh, bring the dish to the next level is just fresh herbs, um, you know, add a little more salt than you're used to. That's what really separates restaurant food and uh, your home cooking food is we, we add more fat and more salt. Uh, fresh herbs, add some crunchy bits. and Nuts are great. Um, like a sunflower seeds are awesome in the fall. And, like, you also like a nice fall duca or like a gremulata. A duca is like a, a nut mix on, like, any kind of squash is excellent. Mm, or just a dollop of caviar will do the trick, right? I mean, if you want to get super fancy, we could do that, yeah. All right. Well, that's good for Thanksgiving. I think we've we've kind of checked all the boxes and courses for that meal. Before we end our segment together, though, I want to talk about your online cooking school, keenoncooking.com. Can you expand on that and tell everyone, like, what you can expect when you go on that website? Yeah. So the, the basis of the website is I want to take the intimidation factor out of cooking. You know, we do it all virtually. I'm in my home cooking. I'm wearing my normal clothes. Like, I'm not all chefed up. You know, we start every class with a glass of wine, a little virtual cheers. And, you know, we work through the dish together. But I'm not, I'm also cooking it right alongside of you. We're stopping for questions. And we're really, like, really educating without that fear of, like, am I going to mess this up? Am I going to burn this? I don't know what I'm doing. And then it's all about education. Like, you know, from the basic knife skills of how to properly hold a knife, to make, you know, making a result of one of our best classes. How many people do you have kind of tuned into your class at any given time? So we've done any, any size group. We've done two people to 150 people. Wow. Yeah. That's amazing, Chef. Yeah, it's, it's one of my favorite things to do. You know, I'm, I'm me being self-taught, I uh, later in my cooking career when I came to the well, there's Jason, you know, there's a better way to handle things. And, you know, maybe screaming and yelling isn't the best way like Gordon Ramsay uh, does it. There's a better way to coach. You know, every moment can be a teaching and learning moment. Uh, so I want to give back to young cooks or people who are terrified or say they can't cook. And, you know, all those things that go into that intimidation and cooking, get rid of that. And then really just educating people like you can do this. It's a great way to, re- uh, you know, Get rid of stress. It's a fun team building activity. It's great for date night. You know, corporate oh, events idea, is yeah. excellent for that. Yeah. How long is the class? Is it an hour? They yeah, depending on what class you get, you know, anywhere from forty five minutes to two hours. You know, like if we do the handmade pasta class or the pizza class, that's a longer because you know we have to make the, make sure those are made properly. But yeah, anywhere from forty five minutes to an hour to two hours. And when people are signing up for this class, are you kind of giving them the ingredient list beforehand so they can go to the store and be ready for this course? Exactly. Yeah. A, a, a week before the class starts, we send out a full ingredient list and a full utensils list to make sure you have plenty of time to get what you need. And we also offer a direct line if there's any substitutions. If you can't find something in the store, you don't even know what that is. Uh, direct contact with uh, my team and myself and, uh, We'll get uh, everything sorted out. And we also, you know, the relation just doesn't stop after the class. Like if you are buying, you know, a new oven, you have questions, you can reach out to me. If you are looking for restaurant recommendations in almost any city that's, uh, you know, close to Chicago or, uh, you know, I mean, I have connections all over the United States of uh, what restaurant you should go to and how do I get in, I could also help you with that. That's amazing. Chef, I'm so happy for you that you have so many amazing things going on in your career right now. We do have to go to a commercial break. When we get back, we will be joined by Brian Proctor of Leeds Hospitality Group, who will teach us how to embrace gratitude and give thanks. But I just want to mention again, Chef Drew Keen, keenoncooking.com. He is the executive chef, Gibson's Italia, out in Chicago. I thank you for your time, and I wish you just a happy Thanksgiving, chef. 
We have to go to commercial break. Sounds of fun. Thank you. You're listening to Culinary Confidential with Christina Cates on AM 970, The Answer. Over the last 30 years, Newman Ferrara, a New York City law firm, has evolved into a national practice focused on real estate, commercial, litigation, civil rights, class actions, and other complex litigation, representing many of the city's largest property owners, managing agents, and thousands of tenants. Newman Ferrara handles some of the nation's most significant class actions and civil rights matters. Newman Ferrara at 1250 Broadway in New York City. Go online to NewmanFerrara.com. That's NewmanFerrara.com. Listen to the firm's name partner, Lucas Ferrara, every Saturday at 10 a.m. on Dottie Herman's longest-running real estate radio program, Eye on Real Estate on AM 970. A real estate lawyer for 35 years, Lucas is a professor at New York Law School and is also a published author with books on real estate and New York's landlord-tenant law. Tune in Saturdays at 10 a.m. to hear Lucas's unique perspective and advice on Eye on Real Estate. This is Dennis Prager. If you share my passion for free speech and rational thinking, become a member of the ultimate online community for all things Prager. It's PragerTopia Plus. It's less than a cup of coffee a month. Listen or watch every show, all commercial free. Share your favorite segments with your friends. Now listen commercial free to my friends Mike Gallagher, Seb Gorka, and Hugh Hewitt as well. Stream every lecture and course offered in the Prager Store. PragerTopia Plus members can submit questions for my monthly online Ask Me Anything. Yes, you can ask me anything. We also just added a live chat feature for the Pragertopia community. Chat with me, Alan, and Sean during the show. Great life discussions without restricted topics. Get everything from the show, including lectures, courses, and films as a Pragertopia Plus member. Go to Pragertopia.com and get 20 of the top happiness hours from 2023 for free. That's Pragertopia.com. We can tell you about the incredible success we bring to local businesses, but it's better when it comes directly from our satisfied clients. Here's just one example. After searching for a new vendor to handle my search marketing campaign, I contacted Salem Surround after seeing the great work they did for another restoration company in the different market. Their team of experts recommended a mix of multiple tactics designed to get my business the most quality leads at the lowest cost, making my marketing budget stretch further. In our first year partnering with Salem Surround, we recorded our best year to date, and I've told many people how blessed I was to find them. The representative answered the phone every time I called and quickly addressed any questions or concerns I had. Let Salem Surround give you an absolutely free audit of your current marketing and show you what your competition is doing. Then we come up with a personalized plan that's perfect for your needs. Google Salem Surround New York and let our marketing experts help you achieve real success. Remember to Google Salem Surround New York today. This is Carol Platt. Leave out for townhall.com. For the first time in four decades, Republicans are basking in the embrace of pop culture. Boxers and football players are doing the Trump dance, leaning right as the new counterculture. It's fun for conservatives to swim in the mainstream, especially after having been marginalized by the left for so long. But Republicans will make a great mistake if they draw the wrong lessons from the 2024 elections. Republicans didn't win because a majority of voters signed on to their agenda. They won because the Biden-Harris administration was an utter arrogant failure and because Donald Trump is a unique and engaging pop culture figure who was able to capture key constituencies of working class and minority voters. Republicans haven't yet cemented this new coalition. They can, but they'll need to enact policies that make these new voters' lives noticeably better. Let's get to work. I'm Carol platt Lebow. Welcome back to Culinary Confidential with Christina Cates on AM 970, The Answer. Welcome back. You're listening to Culinary Confidential with Christina Cates. On this episode, we're talking about Thanksgiving. 
Thanksgiving is just a few short days away. And earlier in the program, Chef Drew Keen was giving us all of the tips and tricks on creating a fabulous spread to put out. That's important, but it's only half of the holiday. The other important part of Thanksgiving is about embracing gratitude. My next guest is in studio with me tonight, which I absolutely love. Brian Proctor, welcome to Culinary Confidential. I am so happy and grateful you came all the way into the city to come in the studio and tape with me tonight. Well, I am excited to be here, so thanks for having me. My pleasure. Brian is the founder of Leeds Hospitality Group, a leading hospitality consulting firm. Following his 40-year career in the industry with companies like the Four Seasons, Starwood Hotels, Bridge Street Global, and Evolution Hospitality. He is most recently the host of the popular gratitude-centered podcast, Tuesday's Thanks, where he interviews senior hospitality leaders about their journey and provides them with the opportunity to thank those who have helped them along their way. Brian's gratitude journey continues to evolve, and he has recently developed the Power of Gratitude at Work program, in which he speaks to organizations about adding gratitude to their toolbox of culture related enhancements through actionable daily activities that their leaders can undertake. Brian is an in demand speaker and expert on gratitude. I am a firm believer that things happen when they're supposed to. So it was absolute destiny that our paths crossed. I was just starting to think about this Thanksgiving episode, and Brian came into my life. The light bulb went off in my head, and I said, he would be perfect for this show. If I had met Brian in, say, like, I don't know, March or April, I wouldn't have known exactly how to create an episode around this unique and accomplished individual. But the timing was right, and here we are tonight. So, Brian, welcome again. Thanks. I want to jump right into how you developed the idea of the Tuesday's Thanks podcast. Please give me the backstory. Sure. Well, it really came by accident, really, during the pandemic. Um, You know, we were losing a lot of good people. And I would notice that when we would lose somebody, a lot of people would talk about them. And I thought, well, that's great, but they can't see that. So on a random Tuesday, I just said, you know what? I'm going to commit to thanking one person every Tuesday for 52 weeks, for one year, who made a positive impact on my life. And it really started that easily. I mean, I'm an operations geek. I had the spreadsheet out. I had every place I'd worked, all the people I wanted to thank, all the people I wanted to thank for not being good leaders, left them off the list. And so I did that for a year. And I ended the 52nd one, you know, obviously thanking my wife and daughters for putting up for me, or putting up with me for so long. And, um... The next day, the next week, I was inundated with emails like, Brian, where's where's your post? I, you know, because I mixed humor and that kind of stuff. So then, long story short, I was invited to be on another podcast, um, a great podcast called The Hospitality Mentor mm. with Steve Turk out of Florida. And uh, I did the show and I said, wow, that's awesome. So I said, hey, can I talk to you after the show? He said, sure. So I said, how do you do this? podcasting stuff. I mean, I'm an old guy. I don't yeah, I, I wouldn't even know. Yeah. I wouldn't know how to set up a podcast at it, home. Exactly. So he said you need a laptop, a couple apps, and a microphone and a theme. And I said, "Well, I have the laptop. I got the idea and I've, you know, I can buy a microphone." And so I said, "Well, I know how good it felt for me thanking people every Tuesday. So I got to believe that other people would feel the same." And I'm an old guy. You were polite to say, you know, I'd been around for 600 years. <laughs> but I'm an old guy, so I know a lot of people in the biz. So I said, I wonder if they would like to come on the show. Total stab in the dark. So I just started reaching out to people. And lo and behold, I started with a couple friends, but then kind of branched out. And that's really how the show has come to be. We just, at the, you know, we just wrapped up season four. Wow. So over 130 interviews so far. We'll start season five January. Um, and it's just been amazing from people from New Zealand to Thailand to Dubai, everywhere in between. It's unbelievable. Well, how are you finding people? Like, are people just reaching out to you and they want to be on the show? Or how are you sourcing guests for the show? Because I know for me, I mean, I have to book people for my show, and I usually do about two guests each episode. And I'm always thinking ahead. I'm like, will I run out of people one day? I'm not sure. I mean, but you're four seasons in. Yeah, well, that that's the amazing thing, right? So 
you get a momentum going, and then you have people reaching out to you to be on the show because they hear it. And it's just like you do, a lot of hard work, a lot of yeah. like sending emails, a lot of getting ghosted by people who don't reply right. back. Because it's not for everybody. I get mm-hmm. that. Um, but yeah, you just kind of keep putting one foot in front of the other. And, you know, season five, I said, starts in January. I've, I think I've already got the first nine weeks. Wow. Scheduled. That's amazing. Yes. Yeah, so I'm very, I'm very, very fortunate. You know, I think a lot of times it's about planting seeds and see what grows. Like, you know, even when you and I connected, sometimes I just reach out to people cold, like cold calling them, but it's emailing, sending messages, and you don't know if they're going to respond. And if you reach out to 10 people and two hit you back, you're like, okay, that was that was a positive. And then things stem from there, you know. Absolutely. I mean, I get it's so funny. It's hard to get senior female leaders on the show because not surprisingly, I know this will be a shock, but men love to talk about themselves. <laughs> they like Wh- to mansplain it, things. It, it, exactly. Women, not so much. So that's my biggest challenge is to convince the senior women leaders to be on the show. It's interesting you say that because, you know, for people that don't know, the mutual connection I have with Brian Proctor is Allison Reed. Allison Reed was one of the hotel executives I had on a few weeks ago, and that episode was a huge success and very well received. And Allison was hesitant to come on the show. And I used the fact that she was on the Tuesdays Thanks podcast to be like, listen, you've already done something along these lines. Could you throw me a bone and please come on my show? Like, you're so interesting. But it, that is an interesting concept that, you know, executive females, they, they just don't want to put themselves out there so much. Exactly. So you ask people this question all the time, but I'm curious to know, what are you thankful for? Well, let's start off with Allison because she connected (laughs) us. So I'm going to say thanks to Allison. But I mean, you know, obviously the family, uh, the good health of everybody that's in the family and things of that nature. You know, I'm thankful for the guests and the listeners. I mean, you know, we're, like I said, 130 episodes in. That's 130 people who have trusted me to tell their or help them tell their story. Yeah. So just being thankful for that kind of stuff and, you know, the clients of my uh, Leeds Hospitality Group. And then I'm just kind of thankful for everybody who's supporting me in what I'm calling my second act, right? I was a lifelong hotel guy, like you said, 40 years. That makes me sound old. (laughs) Uh, 40 years in the business. And uh, this is something that who knew I would be doing this? Right. And so anybody who's supporting me in either the consulting or the or the Tuesday Thanks platform, I am so thankful for all of them. Where can people listen to the Tuesday's Thanks podcast? It's, it's on every platform. Uh, it's streaming everywhere. Yeah, it's, Spotify. It's every, Spotify, Apple, Audible, you name it, iHeart. It's I've listened a- to it. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate it. I enjoyed it. it very much. I want you to talk to me, please, about the power of Gratitude Work Program. How did you come up with this, and what kind of companies are implementing this program? So it's basically an extension of what I've kind of learned on Tuesday Thanks, and understanding that I've always used gratitude as a big proponent of my career. I figured it should be a tool in a company's employee appreciation, employee recognition toolbox. So what I've done is I've kind of developed a fun, you know, it's a 40-minute presentation. We talk about what gratitude is. We talk about my journey. I want people to understand that I'm not just some foo-foo guy up there talking about gratitude. I've actually run a front desk. I've actually Mm -hmm. run restaurants and all that kind of stuff in the biz. Um, Talk about my journey in gratitude. And then I share lessons learned from the show. I've been very fortunate to have some great CEOs and leaders talk about gratitude and talk about their journey. So they've pa- so I pass that along. And then I go through the what I call the five steps of the benefits of gratitude, you know, which is pretty simple stuff, but you can actually use data from Harvard Business Review, American Psychological Association. They have all these studies that are out there on gratitude and at the workplace. So kind of show them that. And then I introduce them to what I've developed is the 15-day gratitude at work challenge. And that's enabling their leaders to infuse gratitude into their daily activities with easy to use, not time consuming, actionable items, which hopefully the staff will see 
and then it'll permeate down throughout the, the organization. And we do it for three weeks to test it out with everybody to see how they feel. And then we do a check-in to say, hey, what can we do differently? Do you like it? Some do, some don't. So that's kind of what we're doing there. And realistically, right now, I've rolled it out to hospitality companies. Uh-huh. Um, but gratitude's universal. You, you yeah. could have any type of company, and I could adapt it to that. How are the companies benefiting from having this as part of their practice? Well, what they see is, um, again, under the term of employee happiness, it's very general and mm-hmm. foo-foo-ish. But what you see when you start infusing gratitude in, um, and Glassdoor, love it or leave it, 81% of the people surveyed said that they're, they would work harder for a more grateful boss. Mm. That's a big number. Yeah. And so if you can have that gratitude feeling, your employees are going to work harder for you. The other thing that shows up on these studies that they can start using and seeing real life is there's a reduction in absenteeism. There's a reduction in voluntary turnover, which means you've got a continuity of operational skills because you're not always training, you're not always hiring, you're not always recruitment. Think of it as a general manager of a property or a restaurant or a hotel, how much time you spend on that. Well, if you didn't have to because you had gratitude in there and your employees weren't leaving voluntarily, mm-hmm. your operations could have run so much smoother. And guess what? At the end of the day, you're going to make a lot more money. Well, I also think it's interesting to have a program like this in the hospitality industry because happy employees in the hospitality industry – results in a better guest experience. And this is a guest experience driven industry. Exactly. Could not agree more. Mm, I wish I had this in place in some of the restaurants (laughs) I managed over the years. Well, your next one, you can put it in. The next one I have will be my own. Uh, There you go. That that's my goal one day. All right. Just to, you know, tie this together with Thanksgiving. How can people practice gratitude Upcoming, you know, days before, on Thanksgiving, days days after. How can people just get into a better mindset about how to be more grateful? Well, I think you used the right term in mindset, right? Because there's going to be a lot of interesting dinner conversations around the Thanksgiving table this year, we all know. Yes. But being mindful of, you know, gratitude doesn't have to be this big thing, right? It can just be thankful little tiny thank yous. It doesn't have to be these big ones. Just appreciate the fact that, hey, my Uber driver got me here today. Safely, yeah. Safely. Things of that nature. You're driving. Oh, thank God my, you know, my turkey came out all right. Mm -hmm. Just being thankful. Start with the little things and build up to the bigger things. But it doesn't have to be these big, big things. There's a saying that there's gold in everything. And when I started kind of focusing on that, in life like even if you're having a bad day like okay i did get stuck in traffic on the way into the studio tonight and i took a couple wrong turns but you know what i got here Mm -hmm. and like that's important and that kind of shift in mindset makes you happier in every area of your life exactly so before we go because our show is about to end soon brian i want to talk a little bit about leeds hospitality and what what you're doing with your business there? So with Leeds, I mean, basically there I'm using my, again, as you mentioned before, 40 long years um, in the hotel business to help hotel companies with whatever they need. So basically, you know, I'm a one-man shop, but so whatever they need with help with new builds and transitions or just operational efficiencies, all those typical things that a hotel consulting would help them with. And how can people find Leeds Hospitality? Uh, www.leedshospitalitygroup.com. I'm all over LinkedIn. There's, I have mm-hmm. a Leeds Hospitality link, in LinkedIn page. I have a Tuesday Thanks LinkedIn page. I have my own personal page. Trust me, if you've ever been on LinkedIn, you're going to see me. Yeah. And we'll link all of these you know, platforms for you to the show once cool. this airs. So you're going to see a lot from this, I'm sure. Well, Brian, I thank you so much for your time tonight. I thought it was so interesting that you came into my life when you did and to have you on this Thanksgiving episode. So I'm just appreciative for Alice and Reed for putting us together. I love everything you're doing. Cool. Thank you for having me. Thank you for listening to Culinary Confidential with Christina Cates, Sunday nights at 9 p.m. on AM 970, The Answer. And thank you to my wonderful guests this evening, Chef Drew Keen and Brian Proctor.
Thanksgiving is sure to be better than ever this year with the perspective you both provided. If you want to keep up with Culinary Confidential, please follow the show on Instagram at Culinary Confidential Christina and send me a message if you have a topic or an idea you want to hear on the show. I love connecting with new people. A big hug to my engineer tonight. Matthew, thank you for all your help and guidance. That's all for tonight. Thanks for listening and have a great night. The preceding program is sponsored by Shake It Off Live, LLC.